so next uh, we will uh, start with the lightning uh, talks uh, with how can I become a developer? Hey, uh, my name is Alexey Ulyanov, and uh, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, my experience and the way how uh, you can become a programmer and a little, little bit more. So uh, I have a question. Was anyone asked by your friends, relatives, or just random people, oh, you're a software developer, it sounds cool, how can I become one? Good, uh, I was asked also. And from the beginning I thought maybe you can uh, read official documentation, uh, there are plenty of online courses and books also, YouTube channels, helpful, and many, many more sources. But uh, it's not like this, really. When I started uh, first, I was faced Ubuntu. Okay, I said, maybe interesting. I learned it in some way. Then I was given a task in C++, and then I had to learn this language. Then I realized, okay, it's not enough to know Ubuntu in C++, you need to know Git, you need to know continuous integration like Jenkins. Uh, also, you might need to know JavaScript, CSS, HTML, and so on. So, and then uh, after a while, I, I discovered Python. So, uh, it cost me, that uh, I had to learn Django, uh, Django REST, MongoDB, MySQL, and a lot of a lot of technologies. And uh, to be honest, it's uh, it's cumbersome. It's a lot. It's a vast uh, pl plus of information. So you need to learn somehow. So maybe the question should be not how can I become a programmer. Maybe the question should be how can I become a good learner? Because you you have to learn a lot and there is no end, because technology, they get outdated, obsolete, and for example, you won't be able to remember this picture, for sure, but you will remember this. So, and this is a reason why uh, I put this picture, people tend to uh, 
forget the precise information, but we'll remember pictures, association, emotions, and all uh, what they spent information, uh, like time and for effort. So this is an example from one book. I really love this book because of the structure. In front of every chapter, they provide uh, kind of three. So if you ever mm, uh, like met with the mindset, uh, my, my minds, my, my mind maps. So it looks like this. So and uh, I think if you can teach people how to learn new technology, but not how to work with only one, uh, it will be really really helpful. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was enough to know like one language and then work with this. But today, uh, it's not enough. It's, it's, it's too much probably sometimes, and you need to figure out fast and uh, be able to operate and combine all those technologies into one and make decision. So I think uh, uh, you need to ask how can I become a better learner? Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice talk. And next, uh, Kern uh, Hackathon by Negar. Hi everyone, my name is Negar. Uh, one of the speakers uh, yesterday talked about, uh, in his li lightning talk, talked about, um, so get out there and help everybody else. So I, then I decided, okay, I, I will uh, give this lightning talk. Last year I participated in a hackathon uh, from CERN. Uh, it is uh, mostly related to humanitarian activities. So there you can do a lot of different um, projects. For instance, you can come up with body bags, uh, you can come up with incubators for the kids, and what we did, we worked a lot with the data. So how it works is like uh, you, during the summer, you apply for the hackathon, uh, you fill in a form, then uh, if they like you, they'll contact you, you give an interview, uh, it's just about 10 minutes, and uh, then you're in. After that you're in, you will as a be assigned, in, be based on your interest, uh, you will be assigned to a team. And uh, for instance, in my team, we were about eight people and uh, basically it was from all, ar all around the world and um, they were working with different stuff. The good thing about it was that um, the diversity was good. There were lots of uh, girls and also diversity regarding the background and what you, uh, you have studied because there were groups that they had doctors, they were psychologists, they were lawyers, and uh, we closely worked with um, a big group of um, humanitarian um, people uh, uh, from the United Nations. And so this project was basically um, with collaboration of CERN and United Nations in Geneva. Um, so this was the team that I worked with. Uh, three of them were physicists, uh, most of them were data scientists. Three of them were from CERN physicists uh, who worked a lot with data. One guy was from Google and uh, we had a guy from um, university in England, I don't remember. And um, so uh, what we did basically, I'm not gonna talk about it and I will just show you the video. to clean water, basic shelter, and food are fundamental for human survival. When a natural disaster occurs, multiple international organizations are willing to help. Right now in Nepal, individual effort is not enough. Coordinated effort is what is required. One way to visualize effort is to look at who is doing what and where. This is called the 3W map. However, these maps may not be enough to address the challenges that analysis and decision makers try to overcome. These include the evaluation, planning and timing of humanitarian action. The way in which data is currently handled involves complex manual analysis, which
which is time consuming. The lack of personnel makes this overwhelming. What are our targets then? Our targets are to integrate, visualize, and aggregate humanitarian data. The data sets are coming, for instance, from 3W maps, the baseline indicators of the country, as well as the surveys conducted by the NGOs. And here comes the brain, our cloud-based flexible solution that is accessible to everyone from everywhere. It takes as inputs heterogeneous multidimensional data that is coming from multiple sources. It has missing data as well as complex overlaps. The brain processes this and outputs clear, simple, transparent and structured data. It also classifies it and comes with cool features such as gap analysis alerts as well as a recommendation system. The information can be visualized in interactive and intuitive way. So this is how we visualize the data, but actually we worked on it for like almost six weeks and then three days at CERN. And for the backend, we used actually uh, some scikit-learn and um, Flask. It's very, it was very small, but basically it is showing like, um, based on the longitude and altitude, the information that you're required. For instance, if there is like an earthquake happened here, so um, the decision makers need to know, okay, do we need to supply water in this area or uh, we need to supply food or do we need shelter and so on. So after the, okay, my time is up, but uh, when we demoed this, there were a lot of different stakeholders from United Nations that could help us and get in touch to us. So it's pretty cool. I. I recommend you to apply for it. Thanks. Uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, next, uh, 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 we will have a talk with uh, Rain. Okay, I'm ready. So you may have seen the turtles, or turtles. <laughs> you may have seen the owl stickers around, but with no explanation, and somebody finally caught me with my badge backwards and said, uh, what's that? <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, there's no explanation on the back of that sticker, is there? <clears throat> so I should probably explain. But in the meantime, I'm gonna use this opportunity, since I am up here and giving a lightning talk, to ask you to tweet out to my Twitter handle, Rainstance, or the RDO community, which is relevant to the OWL sticker, and the triple O hashtag, which may or may not be a hint as to what the turtle, not a turtle, OWL. Hi, little OWL. So there's a joke about recursiveness uh, that has to do with turtles, which is why that, that animal keeps coming to my mouth. And it's about a scientist who is giving an explanation of the world and how there's the world and it goes around the sun and there's all these other planets. And after he was done with his research, an old lady came up to him and said, that's not true. It's a turtle. It's holding a plate of the world on a turtle, and he said, interesting, well, what's the turtle on? And she says, uh, 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 it's turtles all the way down. And that's kind of what Triple O is, it's OpenStack on OpenStack. If you've seen the movie Inception, which is a dream within a dream within a dream, 
uh, OpenStack is a cloud that is used to deploy a cloud, and you would learn that if you came to see my talk today. But since you didn't, go to rdoproject.org, learn about what I do a little bit, learn about Triple O, maybe show me some love on social media. And with three minutes left, uh, do you have any questions? Oh, what is RDO? What a great question. I swear I didn't pay him. I'll pay him later. So RDO uh, is Rain's uh, Delicious Open Stack. <coughs> no, I'm serious. That's not a joke. That's real. Okay, it's not. It's an acronym that doesn't mean anything, and we got really sick of explaining that. So we even made a T-shirt that has like all the different R's it could possibly be, and all the different D's it could possibly be, but the O is always OpenStack. And the short version of what the acronym stands for doesn't exist, but what the project is is the upstream version of Red Hat's um, OpenStack version. Uh, so RDO is still upstream, but it is packaged for Linux. I am one of those Linux people. You can tell from my neck beard and, and my gender. Uh, yeah, so RDO is OpenStack, but on Linux. Uh, Red Hat, Enterprise Linux, CentOS, Fedora, Scientific Linux, all that fun stuff. I have quick, 1, 22, 21, 20, 19, or I could drop the mic. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, next, uh, RAS Presenter Pi by Helio. Hi, I'm gonna prove that you can give a talk without a presentation. Okay, so this talk is about four things. VXXU, Luna Sky, Breakpad, and Piracy. Okay, so about a year ago, a good friend of mine, Jonathan, calls me up and he says, Michael, I need some help. I'm really, really stressed. I'm about, uh, I have a deadline in August and I'm gonna release my first game on Steam. I'm really stressed, please help me. Okay, a little bit of background first. VS, uh, VSXU, not the easiest name to pronounce, is a open source kind of pet project he's been working on for like 10 years or something like that, is a music visualizer. It taps into your sound card, it does uh, fast Fourier transform on it, and then it changes what you see depending on the music. It also has a visual programming language to allow you to tweak things. It's used a lot in uh, concerts and so on. But this project has grown, it has module support, plugin support, and as this project has grown, he made one of these plugins to do a game. 
and things grew even more, we contacted Valve and decided that I'm going to release this game on Steam. The BSXU project is open source, but the game would not be. And this is when I came in. He needed my help, and mainly I worked on the build system and trying to, uh, the game was mainly only supposed to be released for Linux, but we were able to cross-compile it using Ming W64 to uh, Windows, and that was mainly what I did. Uh, we also knew that we might need some debug, debugging after the release. And Steam doesn't provide us a mechanism to get logs or get crash reports or anything. So we had to build something uh, ourselves. And we did this using BrakePad. And this is kind of what this talk is about. Now, BrakePad, what it does is that it makes a very, very small core dump. And we built in a mechanism that if a crash occurs, it writes this to the disk, and the next time you start the game, it asks for permission to send this log back to us. And the release date comes, and we make the release, and we start getting a couple of um, bug reports. And very soon after this, the game is pirated and becomes available on, um, on Pirate Bay. Now, this wasn't really surprising. We kind of expected that. Uh, but what we didn't really think about was that this debug system that we had, it kept sending us reports not connected to Steam. The, the game was supposed to work only when you're connected to Steam, but it kept sending us reports. And it was from very strange countries sometimes. Most of them was from Poland. Some of them was from Thailand, from Japan, from Korea, from Ukraine, from Iran. It was very amusing. <laughs> However, uh, BrickPad worked wonderfully. So this is kind of moving into the conclusion part. BrickPad was a good system for us. It worked both on Linux and on, uh, on Windows. And if you're into C, C++, then you might want to look into that. Also, if you want to try out this game, you can find it on Pirate Bay, <laughs> a very early version. It was only the first version that actually was pirated, but you can find it on Steam too. And I sent a mail to Jonathan before I decided to give this talk and asked him uh, if it was okay if I gave it. Uh, and he sent me back a couple of keys for Steam. So I have some keys if anyone wants to. Uh, keys to hand out is in a moment to try them. I do want to say though that it's a very fast paced game, as in it requires a very heavy uh, graphics card and uh, the best experience is like uh, 120 hertz FPS game. So it's kind of like uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, I am Michael, Michael Wickstrom. I used to work for Samsung, now I'm independent. And that is the end of my talk, because time is out. Thank you. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. And next, Hideo will present. Yeah. yeah. Third time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the Rust Presenter Pi, which didn't show very good so far, right? So, who here is working with a continuous integration using Jenkins? Please raise your hand. Maybe this can help you. When you have a Jenkins in place, usually you combine with a Raspberry Pi, right? To have it nicely like this on a TV uh, and the Raspberry Pi hanging around and you can see. But usually you don't just watch uh, this screen which is uh, the radiator, right? You just look uh, several uh, tabs with uh, different uh, uh, builds you are running. Is, is that your environment like mine? 
If you have it, you have the same problem that I do, which means uh, you need the browser to do that for you. So you need to have a plugin, which is basically in JavaScript, which is quite heavily. So sometimes your Raspberry Pi just burns, right? You basically just need to wait. So I was to avoid this using a browser that's available, it's called Epiphany. It's uh, developed by uh, very lightweight, so it doesn't use too much uh, uh, memory or CPU, but at the same time, it doesn't support it to switch the tabs. But this is my friend, Kov. He's a Debian developer, and later he joined the Gnome, and he's one of the maintainers of Epiphany. So I asked him kindly, could you improve and, and add on this feature to have the switching tabs uh, on Epiphany? That'd be perfect, because now we are using Chrome, and that's too heavy, it takes too much memory. And his answer was, no way. And he said, you're no programming man. Do it yourself, you just use WebKits. It's done everything inside. So I just remember, first thing, friendship ends where the future requests start. <laughs> first thing, the most important. But I do know Python, and I do know QT or QT, or PyQT. Why not create my own browser? So. I did it, that's Rust Presenteer Pi, it's a Python 2 to 7, Qt4, it reads a config that's quite bad, it's just a URL. If, if the URL is not uh, available, it, it tries first, it uses URL lib, then it just skips, doesn't show, and you need to run on the latest version, Raspberry Pi and uh, a Jesse or whatever, because of a bug on the compilation from the uh, Libby WebKit. That's the project, and now, I hope I have time yet to uh, let's cry, right? Here is the code. I have uh, the comments how it's done in C++. Based on that, I just created, with a short time here, just for demo, 10 seconds. But it's uh, PyQt. Then it's quite simple, it reads from the config and keep it just showing. And uh, this is because I have uh, some uh, memory leak bug. I think that was because of WebKit, but I'm not sure so far and still keeping it there. That was a call and stop and recreating the object, things like that, forced into garbage collector, you usually don't need it. But it's just a hundred thing, a uh, hundred, uh, because I have a lot of comments, it's like a hundred and fifty lines code, and let's see if it works. Here it goes, it uses like 40% uh, of uh, the CPU usage on the Raspberry Pi, and you have a lot of uh, plenty of CPU available in a very old model, so that's it. Thank you very much for the nice talk. So that actually concludes PyCon SC 2016. Uh, I would like to take the chance to thank you who've come here and who've stayed right till the very end as well. Uh, we obviously wouldn't have a conference without all of you wonderful people who buy our tickets and come here. Uh, and the hallway track would be seriously boring as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors and have another round of applause for them because we couldn't do it without them. Thank you. Um, I would like to remind all of you to um, fill in the feedback form at pycon.se slash feedback. Uh, I'm right, right? Yeah. Uh, it's super important for us to know what we can improve. Um, so it's it's really helpful. And also, if you want a free PyCharm license, uh, you can win one. Uh, I, sorry? No, this feedback form is super long, so you don't have to fill out the entire form. This was the question. Um, and I would like to uh, 
ask you, uh, from the keynote, uh, this talk about systems and fixing systems and breaking, uh, breaking the rules, um, we've been talking a bit uh, during this conference about the fact that the Python community in Sweden is kind of fragmented into different groups and so on, and how much we would like to create kind of a new and maybe a bigger system out of that. So if you're in any way into that, and you don't even need to you know, be prepared to sit on a board or anything, but there will be a mail on the mailing list uh, in a short while for the General Assembly. It will be held online. It's super simple to just uh, listen in and then maybe uh, there's something that you can do uh, to make all of this better as well. Uh, and last but uh, not least, I would like to ask all of the volunteers and the board and everyone who's been working to come up on stage. Please stand up, everybody with the blue shirt. And I would like you to give them an extra long and warm round of applause because they've been working these two days. <laughs> oh. Okay, photo. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh yeah, I'll see you next year. <laughs>